Thank you for coming today. My name is Ruth Ostroff. I'm a Sacramento County Master Gardener. I've been a Master Gardener since 2005. I volunteer a lot at the uh, Ferox Horticulture Center. All of you should have this handout. Uh, we have workshop days that are open to the public. Everything's free. Um, and a lot of hands-on learning options there. So please take one of these. Also, um, there are handouts. If you haven't gotten your handouts yet, we're going to be kind of going through at least some of them, if not most of them. Uh, and then you'll have something to take home with you um, after the class. I'm really excited to be talking about seed starting. I've been gardening since I was a child. I used to get seed catalogs and not know what to do with them. But then I started um, working with friends who do know how to do um, seed starting and it, I found out it's really a lot easier um, than it seemed. So today we're going to touch on um, the requirements a seed needs to actually get up and going. We call that germination. A lot of people call it sprouting. And then after it sprouts, what, do you, uh, what does it need to grow into a, a nice little plant that you can finally go ahead and put in your garden? Some seeds uh, you don't want to start ahead. I mean, it's, it's better. They do just as well, if not better, if you don't start them ahead. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So um, seeds are actually alive. They have little baby embryo plants inside them. They have everything they need to get going. Um, the smaller seeds have uh, less uh, nutritional uh, material inside the seed than the larger seeds do. So they, you tend to um, plant them a little bit, much more shallow. In fact, some need to be run on top of the ground. Um, some, some of the, older, the other seeds, the larger seeds, can be planted deeper and they have enough energy to, to get up out of the ground. And once they do, they start what we call photosynthesizing and that's when they take energy from the sun and they make their own food um, and carbohydrates. We're going to do this talk in two parts. I'm going to talk a little bit about seeds and their, uh, their needs to get them going. And then we're going to have a hands-on. You should be near a table that has potting soil, and some pots. The little pots are little like a compressed paper type pot. And then they all, then there's this clear, what's actually a, a dome, fits on top of them. So uh, we'll go ahead and let you uh, start the, some seeds. There are seed, two seed packets at each table. Please don't open them yet. We're gonna have, uh, we have a handout on how to read a seed packet, which is a really important thing to do because Really, the information that I'm going to tell you, if you didn't have any handouts to take home, a seed packet would be a really good handout for you to have. So we said that seeds need certain things in order to grow. So they need water, temperature, and light, and soil, really. They need air, so air pockets in their soil. I mean, I know there are things growing hydroponically, but we're not going to talk about that today. So. Um, what I, one of the things I wanted to do uh, is to, to show you what you have in your resources here in your packet. So um, if you could like pull out your uh, handouts. So the, the first, um, so the one that's stapled together that has a number of handouts in it starts off here with garden notes that says home vegetable gardening resources. These are websites uh, of, of additional information. You can go back home and um, and, and look these websites up. These, most of the handouts you have today are from the uh, U, UC Natural Resources website. The Sacramento County Master Gardeners website has, a, uh, in the menu has a publications uh, drop down. And when you go into it, there are uh, lots of different, these, these types of publications are in there. So this one, this is your resources handout. Uh, this is my favorite, Sacramento Vegetable Planting Schedule. So if you live in Sacramento County, um, especially in this area, we are, um, we are in what is called uh, United States Department of Agriculture Zone 9B. They have plant hardiness zones. And if you don't live in Sacramento, and you want to find out what your growing times are, you can go on the USDA website and they'll tell you by zip code. You can look that up. So, so that's kind of handy and it, it kind of goes hand in hand with this. If you live in Placer County, 
uh, you, your master gardener planning schedule will be different, slightly different, because it's uh, generally a, a little cooler farther up into the, the hills that you get. We're going to talk a little bit, uh, as I said, we've got water and, and oxygen and, and uh, you know, a few things that are really critical. This particular handout talks about soil temperature, which is really critical for getting plants started. And, uh, and as you, if you could kind of look down here, you'll see each plant has an optimum temperature and then has a range. So it, it will germinate if you don't give it the right temperature, but if you give it somewhere in its happy, happy zone, uh, it'll come up much faster and be much healthier. And most plants, most vegetables that we grow uh, are pretty happy coming up around 70 or 75 degrees. Some need, really need it to be warmer, and uh, those would be like peppers especially, hot peppers, they, they really like it to be at least 80, and they can go up even higher. Then the final page here, which you got a twofer on this one because it's actually the same handout, uh, top and bottom. It's a seed viability chart. It's got a few different, um, a few different seed, a few different vegetables it lists here. Um, I'm going to focus on vegetables, but flowers, uh, this applies to planting flowers also. In fact, it applies to all flowering um, plants that produce seeds. So you'll notice here on the vegetable seed viability chart, if you buy, for example, you buy tomato, package of tomatoes, if you look down here on your list, tomatoes, Generally speaking, uh, four years or so, they're still going to be good. They, if you store them properly, and that would be in a dry, kind of cool condition, I keep them in, my, um, in a cupboard in, an, uh, in a room that the temperature stays pretty constant. And, uh, and they'll last at least four years. But this, this tells you that there are some seeds, um, like onion, parsnip, and um, parsley, that optimally last for only a year. So if, if you're going to buy uh, parsley, or uh, parsley will last a little longer than that. It really, you know, there are different ch seed charts, uh, viability charts online you can look at. They're all kind of similar. They may be a little different depending on who put it together. But I think it's a nice, um, kind of it gives you a ballpark. When you start growing plants in your garden, when you decide uh, in December, January, get these seed catalogs in the mail and you think, well, wow, you know, what do I want to grow in my garden? It's, it's a couple of things to really think about, like what will you actually use? What will you eat? Um, are you growing just for yourself? Are you growing for friends and family? Back here also, I do have a, a variety of seed catalogs. Some of the seed catalogs have a lot of really good comprehensive information about growing different kinds of, of seeds also. Uh, Johnny's in particular I like. It has a section on each vegetable and you can go through and find out all the requirements and, and get if you really want to get in the weeds and nitty-gritty you can do that. The other handouts I have that you may or may not have picked up, one is um, we're gonna, this one we're gonna take a look at. This is how to um, <laughs> understanding information on a seed packet and it's a two it's a two-parter and I would, if you're at a table, uh, you can refer to the seed packet, turn it over, and, and you'll notice um, they aren't exactly the same. Each seed packet that you buy has more or less information on it. Um, the other two are, uh, and this one, this is really good. This is put out not by um, California Extension, it, but it's another cooperative extension. But it's still, um, it talks about when when to start seeds indoors relative to your uh, date of your last frost. And so depending on where you live in, in the U.S., uh, your frost date, your last frost date could be, if you lived in San Diego, it could be the middle of January if you even have frost. I don't know lately, <laughs> it's probably. Um, but if you're up here in uh, Sacramento area, sometime after the 1st of March, uh, toward the middle of March, we, we're at looking at like a 10% frost. Um, if you're really a gambler, somewhere in the middle of January, we still have a 50% frost date, but I, I wouldn't plant anything. It too, um, the soil's way too cold, and the, the air temperature is really way too cold. But anyway, so this is kind of nice because 
you can work backwards and you can figure out what time to start your seedlings probably next year. Or uh, if you have a, uh, this is just a warm season garden I'm talking about right now, but uh, I, I also grow, I grow year round. So, um, and you, you may notice here, as you look around the community garden, you'll see plants like kale and peas and cabbage. Those things were planted last fall and those seeds were started, uh, however, whatever it says here, four to six weeks before, um, before the first frost. So you, you wanna get them in the ground, you know, early. Finally, since not all of you, although most of you probably are somewhere in this area, I know there's a couple of people that aren't in Citrus Heights Water District that I've talked to. Um, I'm not, I live in Rio Linda, which is really only 20 minutes, uh, uh, 25 minutes away. But it is such a different climate in Rio Linda. I'm much more open, um, it's colder, uh, it gets, it's, it's just different. I don't, we don't have a, a lot of um, asphalt and buildings and things to keep the area warm. This handout is approximate frost dates in California, which will also help you understand um, when to start your seed timing for, you know, relative to your frost dates. And so now we're gonna just talk a little bit about um, what the plants need as far as temperature, moisture, and, uh, and also light or darkness. So first of all, as, uh, temperature, you did see on your handout that most plants need to be around 70 degrees. If you are starting your seeds in a very cold garage in uh, middle or January, 1st of February, uh, and you're wondering why they haven't come up yet, and maybe it's 50 degrees in your garage, or it's 60, and they want to be at 70, you can do some things to help improve your odds. You can use, um, you can use something called a, a seed a heat mat, and these, um, some of them have thermostats on them. Um, mine don't, that they, um, you, just, you just put them down on your surface, and you plug them in, and they raise the temperature roughly 10 degrees uh, up from what it is, and it keeps the little the soil in the little seed pods uh, much warmer, and they do germinate much quicker. Um, also, as far yes, do you, do you put the seedlings on that mat? Or yes. The question is, do you put the do you put the pot directly on the seed mat? And the answer is yes. But generally speaking, I start my my plants. I start them in little six packs. I like these ones, they're long and skinny and they don't take up as much room and they don't use as much soil, potting soil, seed starting. We're using seed starting soil for this. This is not your basic potting soil. It's not something from outdoors. You don't use your outside material. You don't mix it with your nice outdoor compost. Lots of different, um, bugs and uh, fungus and various things live in soil outside. So you, and you wanna start with a, a seed starting medium that is, is very uh, fine. And it also has, I don't know if you can really see, but um, if you're at a table, you can see there are a lot of white dots that are inside uh, here. That's perlite. Perlite takes up space and provides pockets of air um, for your little seeds so that, because air is a really important, uh, they need to breathe, seeds are alive. So what I do, to keep answering your question, is I'll start my seeds and I'll, um, I'll put them in a, a little like, see I, I think I, I told you that this is for your little seeds you're gonna bring home. You're gonna have your own little portable lid that's gonna be your greenhouse lid. I like to use shoe boxes and roasting pans from Costco and uh, you name it. I think my very favorite <laughs> they are. They're really perfect. You can get a couple of uh, a couple of six packs in one of these. And the thing about them is they have little holes in them for steam for the chicken. And those little holes are really important because what you don't want to do is to have no ventilation and then your plant um, just it, it can, especially if it's warm, it's sitting on something warm. You're um, you could get algae growing that kind of thing, and and you you don't want that. Of course, if you do have that happen, uh, you can spray a commercial fungicide on the soil, or you can just use peroxide, just your basic grocery store peroxide, and, 
and you can uh, if you see little like green material growing on your seedlings you can just uh, drench the soil it'll kill it it won't hurt the plant so that's just peroxide i understand from the orchid society uh, they say that once you open a bottle you better use it up quick um, i actually had my peroxide not this one this is new but I had one that I opened in 2022 and I was using it on my seedlings before my friend told me about that and it was working fine. So maybe it's just stronger if it's newer. So plants need temperature. We talked about that. And yes, you put your, you put your plant directly on the seed mat. Uh, I, I use the seed mat to germinate everything. Or I'll, I have an extra refrigerator freezer in my uh, laundry room and for things that don't require seed mat, heat, higher heat, like uh, brassicas, which would be kale, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, that sort of thing. Um, I, I do this, I put them, I, I plant the seeds in the little packet, in, uh, in the little six pack, and I put it up on top because it's, it's probably 70 degrees in my laundry room up there on top of it. And so I don't need a heat mat for that. Moisture, applying moisture, yes. Is perlite and vermiculite the same? They're not. Um, perlite is um, uh, provides air spaces, and vermiculite is for holding more water. So, um, in fact, sometimes I'll start. So, I think I, I mentioned briefly that some plants need light to germinate. Your smaller, tiny seeds. In particular, lettuce. Lettuce needs light to germinate. So it's, it's important to have it in some kind of a container with a something and keep it damp. But it's hard to do. Sometimes it's hard to keep it damp. So uh, sometimes I'll put vermiculite, a little vermiculite, very lightly on top so some light can still get in. But it does help keep the moisture on the top. Vermiculite is, uh, is more kind of spongy, like layers. of, uh, And then uh, uh, perlite. Is, uh, is like pumice, it's white, kind of. So moisture is important. Um, and in fact, when you plant, um, plant out in the garden, you can use a temperature uh, and a moisture meter. We do have, I think the district has, do you have moisture meters today here? Okay. So those are kind of nice. You can go out and you can check your moisture in your soil. Um, also there's um, temperature probes, which this one will probably appear here after my talk is over. It's sitting here somewhere. Um, but you can go and I, I really like that because um, some things have to, the soil really needs to be really warm before you start the seeds. Like um, beans, particularly, things like lima beans. If you can't sit comfortably on the ground, well, I mean, if you can get up and down off the ground, <laughs> But if it's comfortable temperature on the ground, um, then it's probably okay to plant beans. Otherwise, uh, they really need to be 70, 75 degrees. So that would be something to consider. So oxygen, we talked a little bit about uh, how we have perlite in here. Um, also, if you water too much, you take up all the airspace with water and you can kill your plants with love. T too much water is just as bad as not enough water. In fact, a little less than optimum. Oh, you don't want them drooping, but a, a, a little bit less than you think they might need is probably better. Like a wrung out sponge, maybe a little bit more damp. When you first start your seeds, you'll want it to be nice and damp. But afterwards, once they come up, um, and once they come up too, you, you don't get them off the seed mat because they don't, they don't need that extra heat. Um, and they, uh, you can, you can eventually uh, take them outside. You can start taking them outside for a couple hours a day and get them used to being out, and that's called hardening off. If you take them out right away and expose them to a, a beautiful day like today, uh, you, may, you may injure the plant. They're just not sturdy enough yet to be out all day like that. Although it's, it's been, I have been taking my seedlings out, but if it were summer, I, I would never do that. Um, and so we talked a little bit about light and darkness. For the most part, seeds don't care. They just, they don't care if it's light or dark, except for things like lettuce and um, stevia. Ste some of these seeds are just like, 
I mean, you need a microscope to see stevia seed. They're really small. Uh, that's, uh, that's an exaggeration, but they are very, very small. Uh, petunias, there are some other things that uh, you can look up. On. In fact, the, if, you buy, uh, if you buy a package of lettuce, it should tell you on the back that it needs light to germinate. So, um, so that kind of brings me around to how to read a seed packet. So if, if you can pull out that handout, and for those of you who are at a table, um, who can take a look at, so on the back of the seed packets, and sometimes depending on, uh, on the seed uh, supplier, you can actually even get more information. This one here says, we are dedicated, this is uh, Botanical Interests, which I, I think is an excellent, um, just excellent brand. We are dedicated to inspiring and educating the gardener in you. That's why we've put even more helpful information inside. So if you want, if you know, try not to spill all your seeds everywhere, but if you want to look inside when it's, this one feels like it's got another envelope in it. So you might be able to just open this, pull that envelope out, and then open the seed packet and get more information um, inside. I don't know if you can open that. So, um, so let's go ahead and take a look at your, your um, how to understanding information on a seed packet. So this is a pretend uh, seed, uh, seed packet. This is uh, put together by Sacramento County Master Gardeners which is why the brand is F-O-H-C, Seeds. That stands for Fair Oaks Horticulture Center, F-O-H-C. So um, if you look at this, the front of this packet, it tells you that the, the brand, F-O-H-C Seeds. So this one would say Botanical Interest. This one says Lake Valley. Um, there's Burpee. Um, I, I'm sure you've parks, lots of different Johnny's, Territorial. Um, and then underneath it, this one says it's an F1 hybrid. A hybrid is a plant that has, um, is, you, it has a, a parent that has specific, uh, specific qualities that the hybridizer wants to keep in, a, in, in whatever the plant is. And then it's, it's bred with an, another, it's crossed with another of the same species with, that has other qualities they want to keep that the first one doesn't have. And so they'll create uh, a hybrid cross, and they'll have different genetic material from two totally different types of plants. I mean, they're, they're genetic, you're welcome. Um, so what, what that means is, uh, the, and the reason, uh, the reason you might tend to buy hybrids um, over what we call open pollinated, a lot of, a lot of people call them uh, heirlooms, and those would be old open pollinated. That just means that if it's an open pollinated seed, not a hybrid, you can generally save the seeds as long as they weren't planted next to something that the bees might cross it with. So if you have, uh, if you only grow one kind of Brussels sprouts or one kind of broccoli and you want to save the seeds for that and your next door neighbor doesn't have 10 different kinds of broccoli, you're probably safe saving your seeds and they'll come back every year. Um, some things like Armenian cucumber they're not exactly a cucumber, so if you even have them planted with your other cucumbers, you can save those seeds. Um, but for an open pollinated uh, variety, um, for the most part, you can save the seeds. Um, tomatoes, in particular, the male and female parts are inside the flower, pretty bound up. So the, they're um, pollinated not by insects, but, but by some sort of vibration that, uh, from wind, like something shaking the plant where the pollen inside drops off onto the pistil, the female part, uh, and, and so they, they generally are safe to save the seeds as long as they're not hybrids. So um, then also this course tells you how much it, it costs, how much you got in here, and then you get the information that I have on all these other handouts that you could just buy the package of seeds and get. Uh, and this says days to harvest, assuming ideal conditions, you know, all of that. Um, there may or may not be a photo. Um, it, there's this one, this tomato. Most tomatoes you want to start indoors, and it tells you when, and it has the USDA map on this one, and it shows you what zone you're in. Um, and then it tells you how to do it. This says, 
Scattered seeds in flats cover with one eighth to one fourth potting soil. Water well, give plenty of light. Um, the smaller the seed, the more it, it seems to do real well with, a, with some light. It, it, it's okay if they don't get it, they'll still germinate, but sometimes they do, they like it a little bit. The, the real tiny seeds, and this, these are gonna be tiny. I think these little cherry tomato sweeties are probably pretty small seeds. So you don't wanna plant them deep when we start planting. So, and then just to finish up here, uh, down here it says packed for 2013. That's really important. You go back to your seed viability chart and you say, okay, I've had this seed, this tomato seed, for 10 years. <laughs> and you could, you could take a chance. One of the things people do to, to check to see if a seed is still viable is they'll take uh, 10 seeds, usually, and they'll, they'll put them on a damp paper towel, like here's your paper towel, put your seeds kind of, and get it wet, get the paper towel wet, and, and roll it up. Roll it up. Stick it inside a baggie and come back in however many days it says to germination on your seed packet and open up your paper towel. And if you have things growing in there, then you know the seeds are still viable. And in fact, you can, if they haven't, um, coffee filters work really well because the seeds on a paper towel tend to kind of like get in the fibers and you can't really pick them off. Although you can, you can cut them off and, and still plant them if, if you want to do it that way. Um, that works good. So, okay, so that's how to read a seed packet. Yes? How do you know how much to water them at first and then when to back off on that? How do you know how much to water your seedlings or your seeds? Um, both. Well, when you first plant your seeds, you want to make sure that the surface of the soil is damp. So I check my seeds every day. If a seed germinates and it dries out, done. Never come back. So um, you want to make sure that you keep constant moisture. Once they're up and growing, they don't have very deep roots at first. So you want to make sure you continue with adequate moisture. Like you touch the soil and if it feels damp, it's kind of like in your garden. If you want to see if it's the soil and you don't have a soil meter, you take a little shovel or you put your finger in and the finger test is really a good one. If it feels wet, it is wet, that kind of thing. But feel your soil and if it still feels pretty damp, don't add water. Does that help? And do you water it from the bottom? So the question is, do you water it from the bottom? And the answer is that's a really good way to do it. I don't ever do that. Having said that, but I do have a lot of people criticize me and say that your seeds probably won't work. Well, they work fine. But I think sometimes when I water from the top and it gets a little too wet, uh, sometimes then I tend to have to use a peroxide. So watering from the bottom is a good idea. When yes? you say water from the bottom, what? So your tray, uh, you would have watering from the bottom. You would put water in here and the plant would take up what they need. And the plant will only take what it needs, so then you would not like over water, because once it's done, it stops the water. So will the plant take up too much water? Uh, generally, no, doesn't seem to be a problem. If you had it sitting in a, like a, a little swimming pool of water and the roots were not getting any air, yes, that would be a problem. I do want to talk about one more thing, just real quick. Um, once you have your seeds up, the first leaves you see are seed leaves, seed leaves. They're called cotyledons. They are not true leaves. In fact, uh, most of the time they don't even look like a, the plant's leaves will end up looking. They're usually kind of a round, sort of a, just a round leaf, thicker a little. But they do, um, once the plant comes up, they do have chlorophyll in them and they'll uh, photo start photosynthesizing and making food for the plant. This is a, an eggplant that I started. You'll notice that one of my little cells doesn't have anything in it. We are not always successful. We're gardeners. This is happens. <laughs> but some of the cells do. And so one of the things I like to do is up, plant, up, uh, upsize them to a larger pot. And that could be anything larger than what you've got it in now. Um, these are pots I've saved from things I bought at the nursery. 
uh, I would put, I would use potting soil, a good quality potting soil. Here's a G and B organic. I'm not promoting this. I'm just having to have this package. Uh, this is a good quality premium potting soil. You don't want to continue with the seed mix. It's so fine. It's not necessary. Uh, this has some other different kinds of nutrients in it. So these round, big round leaves here on the eggplant are true leaves. Underneath it, there's some kind of pointy skinny leaves and those were their cotyledons. So you want to wait before you upsize into an, a larger container. You want to wait until you have the first set of leaves. Um, it could have two sets of leaves, but the longer you wait, the more root bound you're going to have your plants going to be. So uh, you pull when you when you're dealing with plants and you're repotting, uh, you, you never want to pull things by by the stem. You always want to pull from the leaves. They have more leaves. They only have one stem. So what, what happens here is I have three eggplant in this little situation here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, and this is a, a little difficult to see, but I'm going to kind of peel them off. So here's one. And so when I would, I would then put it in here, I'm going to pretend this is potting mix. And I would put my plant, I hold, I hold my plant up. Generally, uh, I make sure my potting soil is damp before I start doing anything. And then uh, I put a little tag in it with its name on it, water it, water. I like these. My roommate drinks a lot of whatever. And uh, so I, may, I, I have a little uh, ice pick and I put holes in the top. And they work great. So I, I'll do that and this, um, is now will will now be happy. I probably should have put a little bit more soil on it. It's got the stem looks like it I planted it not deep enough, but that's all right for our purposes today. So I would do the same thing with the other two. I'm not going to do that right now because we're going to have our little hands-on demo. Um, are there any questions on this um, transplanting? I think it's really important to upsize your little plants. Yes. Can you bypass that step and just put those directly in the garden when it's the right condition for growing? Uh, it's a little small. I think you want a bigger root ball on it, get it a little bit stronger. One thing you can do if you don't want to have, a, you know, a hundred eggplant, like most people don't really want to grow. These, these would be ending up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's a lot of eggplant. Um, you could. You'd be a little overwhelmed, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on if you have friends and family that want them. Um, so I, a lot of times I'll come through, and um, <coughs> you don't want to just pull out the extras. Cut them off with a pair of scissors, cut them down at the soil level, and just let it go that way. You haven't disturbed the roots of the adjacent plant. When I reuse my pots, I make sure they're clean. You can wash them with soap and water. You can, you can soak them in a 10% bleach solution, so that'd be one part bleach to, to nine parts of water, get a 10% um, bleach solution. Um, I, I like to make sure my stuff is clean and sanitary. It's, it just, it eliminates problems down the road. Sometimes seeds come with diseases in them from, or plants come from the nursery with problems, and uh, if you don't rinse your uh, pots out, if you're gonna reuse them, you really need to clean them, you should clean them. Is there any reason I couldn't do eggplants in two and then tomatoes in two? That is an excellent question. And the question is, uh, could I do eggplants in two, two holes and peppers in two and tomatoes in two? Uh, you can. However, uh, they may have different germination times. And so you may, like eggplant takes a little extra time. Peppers do, tomatoes come up pretty quick. So um, I, you can. Something I've done when I've uh, had a problem like that and, and the, like the eggplant's not, and it's been two weeks and they're still not up, and the tomatoes are here, I'll, I'll take a pair of scissors and I'll just, I'll cut it apart. So you knocked off some of the soil when you yeah. took it out of the cell. Yes. Um, Leave as much as you can on. When you pull, so when you pull your plant apart, like I showed you, when you pull your little plants apart, uh, they should have enough root on them that they'll take some of the soil with them. I don't usually do it up in the air. I usually do it down at my workbench so that I can keep as much soil on each 
uh, each one. And, and as I plant them, I'll, I'll do them actually over my potting soil, you know, I'll, I'll have some potting soil handy so that I can take the ones I'm not doing anything with and kind of cover them up so that they don't get too much air. Roots are uh, very regenerative. Uh, in fact, I bought some uh, plants. This is an osteospermum that I bought yesterday. And when I got them home, they were so root bound that when I took them out of the pot, they were all white, you know, the roots were white and the bottom, they were growing out of the bottom. So I just took a knife and I cut off and slit the sides. And that way they don't just continue to stay in that ball. Uh, they'll, they will then send new roots out. Is there one last question? Um, pinching? Pinching. When it gets to a certain state, you pinch the second set of leaves? Um, I, don't, I don't do that, um, but when you, if you have tomatoes and you're growing tomatoes, you'll, you'll notice that tomatoes, a lot of them tend to do a thing called, they call it suckering. It comes out at the node. The node is where the leaf attaches to the stem. You'll have another stem coming out. Um, sometimes if you plant tomatoes, in fact, I think most of us are probably have had this experience where we put the tomato and it looks really nice and then it gets a little bigger and then it gets a little wider and then it gets bigger and wider and oh my gosh, the thing takes over the whole backyard. So you can, you can eliminate or you can reduce that by pinching off some of these suckers along the sides. Um, you don't want to pinch them all off because it, every, every bit you pinch off reduces your tomato harvest. The other thing too with tomatoes, since I have it, in, in, and uh, since I'm talking about tomato real quick, when you plant, when you transplant tomatoes, you can plant them. <laughs> you should plant them deeply. One good way to do that is to um, see. I, I'm holding it by the stem. Um, is to plant them sideways and bring them up, and that way, every bit of soil that touches any of the stem, they have what's called adventitious roots that will grow out along the stem um, and you'll get more good solid root growth uh, underneath. And why did you turn it sideways? Uh, you, it's longer. If you, you could plant it straight down. A lot of times I'll dig a deep hole and I'll plant it up to here even. Um, you can do that. But if you got have a really long tomato <coughs> and you, you can you can just get more roots that way. So we'll go ahead now and um, work ourselves into part two, which is a hands-on. Uh, you will see that you have two packets of seeds at your table. Please, if you're interested in, uh, in, in doing a potting, in working on the potting exercise, that you find a spot at a table. And if you need more soil, I think, do we have any more? Or you? Okay, because I did use some and often. Pots. Yeah. And pots. We have more soil and pots. So <coughs> you should each go home with two pots and two lids. When you plant these pots, this is really important. When you plant these pots, paper pots uh, tend to dry out. So um, you may want to put these in something just to make sure they don't get too dry. When you plant them in the soil, slit them so the roots can come out. They say they, that uh, the roots will grow through the paper. And uh, I suppose eventually they will, but in the meantime, they're gonna make a, a ring around the rosy inside. So when you plant the seeds, you only wanna plant a couple in each, you know, you probably, if they're really new seeds, you probably could just plant one, but it might not come up. So I, I would plant two, uh, two or three seeds. And uh, for the zinnias, cover them. Um, you, usually when you, when you plant seeds, you cover them to uh, twice their diameter. With these little tiny tomatoes, I would put them on the top of the soil and then water the soil and the soil will sink and kind of come over the top of the seeds. Do not use a lot of seeds in your pot, just kind of, or you're going to end up dividing a whole lot of your plants like I showed you earlier. Do not pat your soil down. Put your soil in your pot and, and I'm, this is a table. Tap your table but don't tamp down. You can make little kind of indents if you want and for your seed to kind of sit in. Does anybody like to try some broccoli seeds this fall? I have a couple of, I have this uh, Waltham 29 and this for summer. If you want to take a couple of seeds for two different kinds of Swiss chard, one's called Vulcan, it's red stem. 
The other one is uh, Bright Lights. Bright Lights is, oh, the, the petioles, that's, the, they call it, this, this actually part of the leaf, so it's a petioles. Um, they are yellow, pink, white, orange, bright lights. That's why they call it bright lights. So um, those are, those are here. If you want to come over here and if you want to take some seeds, that would be fine. Okay. I would like some. And then right on here, right on here, Broccoli Waltham 29 Botanical Interest, and that's the year. So remember we talked about it, the seed viability chart. For broccoli, it's going to be maybe five years. But if these were onions, mm -hmm. you better plant them now because right. next year they might not be viable. So in early spring, what do you So this is too late really to uh -huh. grow good broccoli now. It's going to get too hot. Right. So but plant it, um, I would say you can start your seeds the last week of um, August right. inside and the, or the first week of, of September. A lot of the plant sales are in October and when you come, they'll have them for sale mm -hmm. and they'll be up so you can get yourself a head start. Yeah. People start them too late, you know, for the fall. You wanted the broccoli, right? So if you take like six seeds, you're gonna get, those are 20, 23, they're gonna be viable. You're gonna probably get six plants, oh, okay. at least five. I'd be surprised. So plant those on top of the soil. So, so I would um, kind on of, top, yeah. yeah, on your, top of your soil and water the soil really well. Mm -hmm. Um, and but do that in August. Yeah, do it the last week of August, the first week. It'll tell you on your planning chart. Oh, September it says mid September. Okay. But you could start in this in this nice. It, it you know you'll just get them out a little bit earlier. Because yeah. it'll take them um, probably six weeks at least to get up. All right, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you so Welcome. Thank you.